We have Dr. William Olds, Protein Tech Group, uh, speaking on life after flow using correlate fluorescent dye, dye conjugated antibodies to simplify your multiplex imaging. Okay, perfect. Um, first of all, can anyone besides myself hear me? Yes, you're all good. Okay, yeah. good. Okay, great. Wonderful. Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to talk today about some of our um, new antibody line that we have for uh, that are directly conjugated to, to um, our proprietary dye. And uh, I was a little nervous when first pitching this to the uh, to the to the steering committee because I was like, it's not exactly flow. Are they going to be okay with that? And uh, so fortunately, they were. So I'm really excited to uh, dive in here. Um, so first of all, um, I'm betting that a lot of you have not heard of Protein Tech. So um, I would just want to say thank you and thank you for listening and uh, it's great to meet you. So let me tell you a little bit more about how we operate our product lines, just so you have a little, know a little bit more about us uh, before I dive in here. Um, so we were started in 2002 and uh, we really focused on making good um, proteins. So we, may, we make a lot of whole, um, full length proteins and we use those to make high quality antibodies. And the idea is that um, of this is that the immune system is so complex and knows so much, so much better than we do about what the most immunogenic places, places are, as well as the complexity of the folding of proteins. Um, a full protein can, can tend to make higher affinity, higher quality antibodies. And so um, we make several different types of antibodies using those proteins. So rabbit polyclonals, mouse monoclonals, and uh, very recently, um, rabbit recombinant antibodies. And so right now we have a we have a uh, 12,000 plus target coverage of the uh, human genome, and uh, using all those different pieces, the different uh, antibodies, we also uh, make ELISA kits where we also have about 200 plus uh, target coverage. And uh, recently we've been making we've been making uh, human cell express proteins, and so uh, in our human kind line, which are human cell express cytokines and growth factors. Um, so these are proteins that tend to have a lot of postgenital modifications, sugars, uh, other things that E. coli or other bacterial or yeast systems cannot do. And so these um, are made by hexagen three cells, and they have tend to have high activity and stability. And so using those, we've also made uh, a series of neutralizing antibodies that are that neutralize the effects of these different cytokines. And as well as our Ascentokine ELISA kits, which are ELISA kits using the uh, human cell express proteins as kind of the base for testing. All right. And so um, I like to say that validation is our middle name at Protein Tech. And um, so over three quarters of our R&D cost is validation. And this is uh, one of the highest uh, in the industry. So we take this, we take this seriously. We put our money, we, this isn't just a slogan, this is something where we actually put our money into. And the other thing is that we have uh, total quality control. Um, everything that we sell is done in-house. All the data you see, we've done ourselves. And so we have complete control over all of the products and we know and we can exact, make sure that everything uh, holds up to our standards. Uh, for every sample that we do, we do multiple, or sorry, every antibody that we make, we um, test on multiple sample types and applications. Uh, we were the uh, first antibody company to implement uh, genetic knockdown and knockout testing and validation of our antibodies. And on the right there, you can see our award um, from CiteAv, which is the antibody search engine, and uh, where we got the award for being the first to uh, implement this. And uh, we didn't just kind of stop there. We were still the leader in target coverage of uh, genetic knockdown and knockout uh, validating the antibodies. Okay, so you've done your experiment and Eureka, you figured it out. You've got this, uh, you've got your flow cytology experiment and now you see, oh my goodness, this is it. I have not only cured cancer, I have cured COVID-19. And, uh, but you know that for all kind of scientific stories, it doesn't, doesn't just end with the flow cytometry. Uh, generally, you have to do something more. And so flow cytometry is really spectacular for telling you about the different puzzle pieces, where the contours are, where things jut out, 
what each the color of everything what it what it actually is like however um what's also very important is how these puzzle pieces fit together what they look like and so that's where ihc and immunohistofluorescence come into play and can be very useful for helping to further test and and uh and indicate your hypotheses so for flow cytometry um there are new machines out and that i've seen uh you can get you know more than 32 colors and especially using uh tools like like a uh, flora finder you can make your panel to get um more than 32 colors relatively easily however for when you're doing this for for staining for ihf getting more than three colors is tough right you know you can usually get um a red with like a cytosalkin stain that blue with your dappy and you can get a green with with a, a with whatever secondary that you're using and so what's the bottleneck why is it so challenging so as i said you can know you can use dappy now you got the now you got the blue there for the for the the nucleus you add some phylloidin in there that's got a red dye on top and then you find um, that you're really interested in this square, this triangle, and this rhombus uh, proteins. So you, you go around and you find some antibodies, you find a really awesome, well-validated mouse monoclonal antibody. And then you find some uh, rabbit-hosted antibodies for the triangle and the rhombus. So there's no problem at all with finding a secondary that will pop right on top of uh, the square, this an the mouse antibody. The issue, though, is when you start trying to get a secondary to detect the, the triangle or the rhombus proteins. Because whatever secondary you, you add, it's going to be specific for the rabbits, so it's going to get both of these guys. And that's what you don't want. You'd like it to be something, a different color that you could use. And because most of the stuff on the market is either rabbits or mice, it's a challenge. And so um, I'm sure many of you have felt this way before. You know, I wish things were more, I wish life was more like flow. And uh, so at Protein Tech, we've been listening to you guys. And so we've created a line of uh, directly fluorescent diconjugated antibodies that we call Coralite. Um, coral, because, it, because of the beautiful fluorescent co uh, colors that you see uh, in the ocean on the coral reefs and light for obvious reasons. And so we've created uh, this Coralite dye in three different flavors. Um, one that we call Coralite 488, that acts a lot like Alexa 448, Coralite 594, and Coralite 647. Okay, so what are Coralite antibodies? So these are antibodies that um, have previously been validated or published and that now are conveniently conjugated to multiple colors and are ready to use. It's a proprietary fluorescent dye, and um, in, terms of, in terms of testing, it has uh, equivalent um, parameters as Alexa dyes and brightness, uh, stability, and size. And so on the right there, you can just see some of these, these spectral graphs uh, of, this, of these dyes. And currently, we have a target coverage of about 400, uh, 400 targets, and we're continuing to grow um, that figure about 10 to 20 uh, every, every month. And so what types of targets currently do we offer for, for, for uh, Coralite? So as I said, we have about 400 or so at this time, and um, we picked kind of the, the the who's who of proteins and cancer, immunology, neuroscience, organelle markers, and different stem cell markers. And some examples you can see here on the right, which is lamin B1, acetylate tubulin, tubulin and cadherin, alpha tubulin, beta actin, cytokinin 18, all the rock stars that you've uh, heard again and again and see in every single paper. And so each of these antibodies we have validated for use in immunohistochemistry histofluorescence as well as um, as well for cytochemistry as well and as I mentioned before all these antibodies that we're using as a parent to conjugate to the coralite dye 
have all been previously cited in major journals. So these are great antibodies that are turning into correlates. And we're adding every month more and more. Um, so um, I'm sure many of you, as I've seen on Instagram, many of you guys at home are making your sourdough bread and everything else. And great, as you know, great dishes start with great ingredients. And so for our antibodies, um, we start with um, kind of our mono, usually our monoclonals that have been published, have KD, uh, KO validation to them. So we know they're awesome. They, they're really spectacular, that they will work spectacular in a variety of, in, uh, in a variety of imaging contexts. And then from there, we add a dye and poof, it becomes a correlate conjugated, um, this, uh, in this case, CD206, which is a macrophage, which is a macrophage uh, marker. You can see kind of that green here, is, and it's also stained with staphy in blue. Okay. So now uh, the major the major question is, okay, so how does it look in action? So here is a really great staining that some of my colleagues did of some hep G2 cells using um, a mitochondrial marker in green called ATP5A1. And then in red, you can, you can see another one of our correlate antibodies that's conjugated, that uh, one of these is conjugated to cytokeratin 18. And uh, then DAPI is in blue. As you can see, it, it, the staining is very consistent with what you would expect for both of those, um, both of those uh, targets. So that was in the tissue culture realm. This is in a in an actual real tissue. So here's a picture, a triple staining of um, fixed rat brain tissue using uh, GFAP, which is a glial marker, and that is in green. And then MAP2, which is a microtubule associated protein, and that is in red, and then blue is in DAPI. And so since these are, so for example, let's say you wanted to look at all these, and then you have some other protein that you're really interested in that you think may be the cure for, for cancer here. Well, now you can just add your mouse, you know, your primary antibody that's not conjugated to mouse, and your other one that's conjugated, that's a rabbit, it's not count, again, unconjugated, and then you can add your secondaries on there, and now you're up to, uh, up to, up to five different colors at this point, and you can really do some very complex analysis. And so some of you may say, well, how does this compare to the indirect staining that we normally, that we normally do every day? So on the left here um, is a mouse brain that's been stained with a uh, beta tubulin 3. And so this is a, this is a, uh, this is a target that's specific to the, to the, to the brain. And on the left here, you can see this with just using our, the normal indirect method. You can see some of the, you can see some of the green, in the green here, you can see uh, the structure of some of these neurons here. And, but uh, you do see quite a bit of background. There's a little bit of kind of a green tinge to everything here. However, with, when using the same uh, antibody, but conjugated to Coralite 48, you can see this kind of beautiful staining here. It's not really too many artifacts. It just looks as you kind of would expect it. And then here's kind of zoomed out kind of how it looks within the greater tissue context. And then with our 594, uh, and then again, here's it conjugated to 594. And you see the same, same thing where the colors are just very bright, distinct, and it's very clear where, the, where it is. And so you can see here how using uh, direct staining can sometimes be a great way to avoid some of the artifacts that you would get from the signal amplification uh, with indirect staining. So when should you use uh, correlate antibodies, right? Every tool has its place. So as I mentioned before, multiplex imaging, this is a really spectacular tool. These antibodies are really spectacular tools for this. Um, they're also great for uh, labeling your cell markers. You don't want to waste uh, a channel or something on, on a cell marker. You know, you want to use it up for what's really important, what you're really trying to discover in your study. And then, he, and then also for organelle labeling. 
and then for proteins that are just highly concentrated in different parts of the cell. And so here's an example of uh, Coralite being used in um, HeLa cells. Um, and so this is one with cytokeratin 18 again, a uh, great cytoskeletal marker. And you can see how um, in this one, the Coralite antibodies get this really great kind of network. It really looks like the spider web uh, that the textbooks really tell you all about. And then on the right here, I have um, GPAT, the glial marker, and you can see kind of how uh, distinct the patterning and staining uh, is on here as well. Uh, again, DAPI is in blue. And so here are some ones, it's just some ORNL markers. So LAMIN-B1 is a nuclear envelope uh, marker. And it's, DAPI is in blue here, and as you can see, the, the uh, the lamin B1 that's conjugated to Coralite 647 is making a nice ring around the DAPI, the DAPI stain here. And then on the right here, we have Hep G2 cells that have been stained with COX4. COX4 is a uh, protein that is expressed in mitochondria. And so you can see here how uh, this again kind of follows the kind of different punctate kind of staining that you would expect for, uh, mitochondria, for mitochondria. And lastly, I mentioned that correlates safe for concentrated proteins. So, so, um, on, so these are some MD, MDCK cells, and these have been stained with RL13B. Um, you may not have ever heard of this protein, but it's a protein that is expressed in, uh, in uh, cilia. And so um, these kind of looks like just kind of like a little worm here, right here and here. Um, this represents the, um, the cilia of these, of these cells. And then, uh, so this is with it stained with CL4, country it's CL488. And then this is it with it stained with Coralite 594. And as you can see, there is a great concordance showing again that these are very specific and, uh, are re and can really stain these concentrated proteins where there's, they're just very concentrated within the cell. Um, so the correlated antibodies are, are great in a lot of cases, but they're not Superman, unfortunately. They, for, if your protein that you're interested in is, has low expression, it's just, it's, it may not work. And so, um, it's probably obvious to you, but, you know, if, if there's only like one epitope here within the cell, you're not going to see the signal, right? You're going to need to amplify it. With uh, in, with a second with an appropriate secondary in order to signal it in order to boost the signal up to appropriate levels. Um, and so again, I know you guys are, are are flow folks, and so I'm sure you guys are asking, well, you know, you got dyes on them. Can I use them for flow cytometry? And the answer is uh, maybe. <laughs> we're so we're still testing a lot of these for flow cytometry. And this is something that's going to be a phase two uh, for this, this line of products. Um, some antibodies we've had uh, some great success with early on, so we're very, rather um, optimistic that they will be uh, great uh, in flow cytometry. And um, we've already added ourselves to uh, Flora Finder, which is a really spectacular resource. Um, and so you can find us on there or on the web. So, really, um, in conclusion here, uh, with flow cytometry, it's quite easy to, you know, it's quite easy to get more than 32 colors in here. Um, and with Coralite antibodies and your, fluore in your immunohisto uh, fluorescence experiments, it's now easier to go over four, right? You can have your Coralite 6.7, your Coralite 584, what are the rabbit secondary dye you're using, Coralite 48, and your and DAPI. And uh, lastly, um, is more of kind of a, an ask for you guys, a request for you guys. You know, we're, we're not psychic like uh, Professor Xavier here. Um, we, you know, tell us what you want. Um, you guys are doing the cusp of what's, of what's uh, known. And so we need your assistance in knowing what we need, what we can do um, to help further uh, accelerate your research with this product line. And so with that, um, I want to thank you for listening, um, and here's some of our contact information. 
And again, feel free to contact me um, if you have any questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, Will. we really appreciate it. Um, and we do have uh, a couple of questions that are popping through on the sure. Q&A, so I'll, we'll get started sure. on those. Um, sure. So the first question, it is definitely a little bit more flow cytometry uh, oriented, and I actually have had a sure. question, so thank you to uh, Kurt sure. for this. Um, have you had a chance to test the correlate dyes on a spectral cytometer like the Aurora? Do any of these dyes have distinct spectral signatures compared to their Alexa floor counterparts? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. That's something that we are, um, that we are testing at this moment. Um, so ask again in about a week and we'll have, and we'll have, a, we'll have an answer for you. I know that there are some people that are working on uh, the, Aurora, the Aurora specifically for that. So I apologize, I can't give a full answer at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, and then uh, Jay Enton had asked uh, phase three, are, are there correlate, like, or, or would there be uh, options for heavy metals um, for the CYTOF and mass cytometry utilizing your proteins, uh, your antibodies rather? Yeah, so um, we, we don't, at the moment, we don't have any plans for using a heavy metal um, direct conjugate. Um, we do offer all of our antibodies in a glycerol-free, azide-free format so that you can conjugate them yourself. Uh, but at this moment, we're not quite planning uh, for heavy metals. But like you said, that could be phase three. But uh, at the moment, we, we are not focusing on that. Okay, wonderful. And then we have uh, a couple more questions um, that came through from Ben Daniel. So thank you, Ben. Um, so the next few are going to be coming from him. The first is, uh, what, uh, what are the molecular weights of your correlate dyes? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know offhand. Um, if you would just send me your contact information, I'm happy to follow up with the, with the lab to figure out exactly what the molecular weight is. I apologize. I don't know that offhand. Okay. Um, um, and then do you need any special buffers that they don't stick to each other? So kind of like how uh, you might need um, a brilliant stain buffer or super bright buffer. Uh, are there any similar buff buffers that you would need for the Coralites? Um, no, it seems to work just, it seems to work just fine without it in our testing. Okay. Um, are any of them tandem dyes? Uh, no, not at this time. Okay, perfect. Ben still has two more questions. Thank you again, Ben. Um, what is the photo? Great job. <laughs> yeah, no, he's, he's, uh, wonderful. Uh, what are, what is the photo stability of these molecules? Yeah, great question. Um, again, uh, Ben, if you want to email me, I can send you the slides for this, um, for the, uh, for the uh, photo stability um, of that, of these. I have it in, I have it in my email archives and I can send it over to you. Okay, and then he has one more and then I also have a question. Um, so sure. does, uh, does PFA affect the, um, the Coralite dyes? Uh, no, they do not. We, uh, we have tested it on unfixed and fixed cells. It's totally fine. Um, and then my, my question, which I think is, uh, is potentially the last, but if anyone has any remainder questions, please feel free to utilize the, um, the Q&A. So I'm curious if there's any uh, cross-laser excitation with these Coralite dyes. So for example, you know, um, is it mainly just ex excited off one laser line or can you have um, a bit of cross-laser across multiple wavelengths? Um, so we don't, so look, yeah, so let me go back. Um, So it is, um, no, I don't have like the real, um, so that it is expected to have a little bit of, of bleed over, um, as you can kind of see from this little spectrograph that we have here. And uh, so there could be uh, a little bleed into um, other channels. Okay, yeah, and that's, that's for the emission. And then for the, for the excitation, yeah. is it, does it have like a, like a pretty wide distribution for excitation or, or just for the emission? Uh, just for the emission. Okay. Great. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. I think that um, those are all the questions that we have. And again, really wonderful timing. Um, so thank you so much for, for an awesome, awesome talk. Yeah, my pleasure. Take care.